Hello, Pavi. Thank you for being here for a third conversation um, that we use in order to discuss about basic Buddhist concepts, uh, but as kind of um, as a very loose foundation, we take ideas from the book When Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron. It's some sort of a modern spiritual uh, classic uh, in the sense that it introduces uh, a variety of Buddhist topics in a very understandable way to a broad uh, lay audience. And the first two parts we spoke about fear, where I commented on the psychological and the psychotherapeutic aspects of how to approach that. Uh, the last time we spoke about uh, the chapter that uh, gives the name its book, uh, the book its name, which is When Things Fall Apart, uh, and basically deals with uh, a certain type of uh, personal crises. And um, we didn't go very far in that, but basically it was important for me to distinguish what is a suitable crisis, crisis that is, is where it makes sense to look at it from a Buddhist perspective. And uh, I'm sure that we, we go to the content of that because I'm still kind of pre-Buddhist in the way that I elaborate my thoughts on that. Um, but I'm sure we will, we will go um, today and in the following parts uh, more into core Buddhist ideas on uh, Pema's uh, conceptualization of that and uh, my comments on that and how I would offer an alternative uh, description of what she writes about. So with that said, hello, Pavi. Hello, Doc. So um, today I wanted to, I, I think today we'll end up going a little bit more into the Buddhist concepts um, uh, because uh, like we like we said, right, the last chapter was, uh, the last podcast or the last chapter was very much around the whole when things fall apart, the personal crisis that happens. Mm -hmm. And um, and in a summary, right, like this next chapter, uh, which is the, it, the title is called This Very Moment is the Perfect Teacher. Um, and here she talks basically about, um, about not running away from that situation, right? Like staying in that personal crisis, staying in that um, embarrassment, that moment of irritation, that moment of disappointment. Mm -hmm. And those are the moments that teach us we, that where we are holding back, right? She basically says our instinct, and I think that is true for all of us, is we run away from like a bad situation, right? We, yes. um, disappointment happens, I go watch Netflix, eat a tub of ice cream, um, go get drunk, need to just like, run away right we and what she says is we just eventually we just become addicted to whatever helps us distract from that situation i think mm -hmm. that this is something that most of us agree is absolutely true for a lot of us and you know the entire industry around netflix and hulu and all of that have been created around that um uh, and what she says is instead to sort of do is live with the, she uses the word uncomfortableness of the, you know, the disappointment, the embarrassment, the irritation. Mm -hmm. um, and she says, when you observe yourself, you see how quickly you, you know, you run towards escaping from that situation. But instead, what you need to do is you need to live with that uncomfortableness. We need to, um, move forward and let that um, emotion sort of stay with you. And the way I thought about that was um, an example, right? Like, for example, you go to work, right? You go to a work, you have a work meeting, you say something stupid or you mess up, you get irritated in a meeting, something to that effect, right? Something like that happens mm -hmm. and you're really upset about that you know you fucked up now the way that i i and i think most of us react is we'll go out go for a drink complain you know or go home 
uh, go shopping, do something or another to just like stop thinking about it. Um, but my question is like, what she's saying is to like, just keep sitting, right? Like to go home and, or whatever, right? After the meeting, after the fuck up, go home and like stay with that situation. Let that emotion sort of like up of embarrassment, upsetness pierce you. Okay, here's my but, first question to you. Yeah. Isn't that what we're doing anyway? What's the difference? Obviously not, right? Obviously we're no, not doing we're not, what right? she- We're running away. Like I want to just- Okay, like, but I take my walk. Drink, complain about that person rather than actually looking at what the fuck up was or like, you know, um, but, right, and not want to think about it. Uh, yes. Am I not still contemplating the thing? That I messed yeah, but up I try all to the suppress time. it, right? We we suppress what am I, it. Like, what am I, I don't to want that thought to happen. Uh, that situation, that situation that plays on repeat in my head. I talk about that, it. Oh I complain God, about I it. I, I bring it up into plan. my mind. What what is it exactly that I'm trying to suppress? If we stay in this metaphor of suppressing, not the event. The, it comes back, and I indulge in the, it, and I get upset about it again and again and again. That's the thing. It's it's that it's that emotion, right? We are running away from that emotion of feeling embarrassed, the upsetness, the, you know, I messed up, I said something absolutely stupid in a meeting uh, that I shouldn't have said, or I should have said properly. And I'm like, oh, I should have said it this way. I should have said it that way. Okay. Right. Like, you know, that thought keeps coming over and over again. Yes. And, and but that... allow, me, allow me still to disagree. I'm sorry that I'm interrupting here, but mm -hmm. it's, Okay, so you're saying we, we're trying to run away from this moment of embarrassment, but isn't that what it's coming up again and again? So I, I repeat typical scene, right? Mm -hmm. I messed up in a meeting, I said something stupid, right? Right. Uh, now, what usually happens is that I repeat in my mind the scene again and again and again, mm -hmm. starting, but, but what with my, starting with my embarrassment. I start with that. So I'm not suppressing that. I come up with, no, I, I should don't. have said that. I, I come up with a solution that I didn't have at that moment, but I relive the pain again and again and again. What no, is it that I'm I exactly do. suppressing? So what I'm suppressing in that moment, generally for me is like, you know, if, if I wouldn't run away and if I wouldn't go out for a drink or watch Netflix, yes, my subconscious, one part of my brain is just reliving that situation. Yes. Um, but if I just sit down, and say, okay, what's happening? I'm not only gonna remember this situation, I'm gonna remember all the other 200 situations in my past that happened. Yeah. And then I just go into this like, you know, full on pity mode and upsetness. And that is where what she's saying to do. To me, either situation is like, you know. So wait, you like, your interpretation of what Pima says uh, is that you should go down the rabbit hole of Sitting and like up again and again, and the thousand situations before that that are triggered for that is that your and yeah, yeah. I think like basically, and I'm going to read it actually word by word because she says only in that moment does that egolessness that Buddhists talk about happen. And you know, just quoting her uh, literally from the book, she says, When you do that, we will be softened by the sheer force of whatever energy arises. The energy of the ang of anger, the energy of disappointment, energy mm -hmm. of fear, and when it's not solidified in one direction or another, uh, that very energy pierces us to the heart and it opens up, and this is the discovery of egolessness. So, sort yeah. of like you know, to me, what she's saying is like sitting in that moment, really just like feeling that moment is when egolessness happened, but. I don't yeah. even understand the meaning of the word egolessness. So I kind of wanted to Thank talk Thank you for about saying that, that because it's not understandable from this context. Okay, let me say a couple of things to that. Uh, first of all, it's not the egolessness. It's not the Buddhist egolessness. It's, let me say, it's a kind of a small bit of some egolessness that happens. The Buddhist egolessness is an incredibly high concept that is reserved for a meditative insight that has nothing to do with situations and feeling good or feeling bad, you know, those mundane things that we kind of experience and that we work with, which is much more psychological approach to situations. 
the Buddhist egolessness in the in the historical sense, so not the popularized mm -hmm. sense, is when is a result of a meditative insight that goes into the foundations of how, the fabric of the mind, the whole code, if you like, if you speak in mm -hmm. uh, programmers and coders language, we go to the basic code of how the mind is programmed. Neo matrix style, this is what we're talking about, mm -hmm. then the historical uh, egolessness comes up, which is equivalent, you can think with attaining Nibbana, this is what the ego, the, the realization of egolessness is in historical Buddhism. And here you understand for sure that okay so whatever she's talking about she's not talking about nibbana because i'm able to sit with my embarrassment uh due to the meeting but that is how you improve right like i kind of like agreed even though our instinct generally is to run away go complain get drunk um only when i finally sit down and say okay why did i fuck up what happened right like um only when I observe myself do I actually start to learn and and I think that is what we when you and I have our own personal sessions exa mm -hmm. that's exactly what you do if you ask me okay you know probably you again fell into that same situation at work yes. um, what how would you approach it next time you sort yes. of think through okay how am I going to do certain situation next time what was I getting out of that situation all yeah. of that and 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 to me, that's exactly what she's saying, right? Like sit in that situation, feel that situation. So um, do you not agree with that approach? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So um, let me distinguish uh, again, as I did before, the psychological and the spiritual or the psychological and the Buddhist mm -hmm. in that sense. What she's mentioning is a kind of a mix. What what you mentioned right now that I, you know, those kind of conversations mm -hmm. that I also bring up, like, what would you do differently? Was it really the total failure that your kind of your destructive mm -hmm. fantasy makes it out to be and so on? This, this I would categorize as psychological talk. This is kind of looking okay. at a phenomenon that happened. I deconstruct my memory. I recontextualize it. I look at mm -hmm. it from different perspectives. Uh, so we gain a little bit more degree of freedom. We are a little bit freer of our automatic emotional judgment, catastrophizing mm -hmm. in, in brackets uh, judgment, so that we are able to, to look at it a little bit more freely to, to see other aspects of it. This is not spiritual and this is not Buddhist. What she refers to, mm -hmm. she puts it in words that are kind of very understandable, mm -hmm. but she, what she refers to is something else. And um, let me introduce a concept here that uh, is implied in what she writes, but she doesn't put it in this way. Uh, and that is non-reaction. I actually introduced it a little bit already in the example uh, of uh, two podcasts ago when I spoke about the one example where we find in the old Buddhist texts how the Bodhisattva mm -hmm. Gautama before he became the Buddha uh, treated himself uh, against fear. He went to a frightening place, sat down, recognized uh, and perceived how fear crept up within him, and then decided not to react to it. Not to react means not to do what we usually do. What we do with fear is we run away or we attack. These are the two things, right? We can run away physically. So, you know, ghosts appear yeah. at the graveyard, I run away with my legs or mentally I go to a happy place where I comfort myself, everything will be fine, you know, to maintain calm and so on. Neither of this I did. He decided to just not react, to not to get into the gear that emotion wants us to get into. This is the very much the same principle here. And I would further separate it in what we are talking about. We're not talking about situations anymore. I don't talk about, I reflect upon my meeting and my embarrassment. These are two big chunks. These are very crude big chunks. When we talk about the principle of non-reaction in a meditative spiritual Buddhist 
con context. We talk mm -hmm. about going into the mind, being acutely aware of a moment to moment passing of the content of the mind. And by moment to moment to moment, I mean, you know, one tenth to one hundredth of a second, something like that. So it mm -hmm. really, it's a rapid succession of things that are actually going on in the mind. And in that ability to observe, I recognize that the mind wants to take me away on a journey. This is what emotions do. They want to take me away. They, and here you mm -hmm. can use a metaphor that you like. There is a train and the emotions want to swoop me up onto a train. And uh, before I know it, five minutes later, I wake up from a daydream where I went down a rabbit hole and I ask myself, how did I get there and why am I here? But aren't you supposed to sort of do that a little bit when you are, um, how else do you process your feelings and your emotions, right? Like you do have to like sit down and and say like, oh, okay, I, you know, going back to this example and sticking to it sort of like, you know, oh, I again made this all this mistake, I did that like, is that also not meditation? Is that just like chewing your thought and then? Yeah, I would say this is psychological. I would okay. put it in that camp, not because, just because it's so different from what the meditative approach is. The meditative approach, and, and I can confidently mm -hmm. say that this is what she had in mind when she talks about the energy that is released and so on, because this is exactly the experience when we approach this meditative uh, kind of stand towards uh, these phenomena of embarrassment, pain, and so on, I kind of, in the moment, right? Uh, so what happens is I see, the, I, 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 I get into this laboratory mm -hmm. style of artificial mindset of present time, acute, observation of my mind right let's assume we can do this somehow without saying how this is done but let's say we do mm -hmm. this the experience then is that i can see it already coming up there is a certain small discomfort then it starts to materialize as an impulse of memory which wants to bring me back to the moment of pain right then the image comes up of me sitting there saying something, then my boss says something, and then the whole full-fledged emotion is there. Then I recognize how the emotion wants to take me away. I don't react to that. I let the emotion pass. I let the scene pass. I don't react to it. And then, interestingly, what happens is it's if this whole image falls into its basic parts like a theater set. It's so like there's the curtains and there's the audience and there are the chairs and there are the actors. And it's all of this suddenly becomes apparent as uh, cardboard props mm -hmm. for a certain purpose to take me away on a journey. And it exposes itself at that. It basically falls off and what is left is the energy out of which the emotion is constituted but without kind of the clothes of the trip, without the clothes of the journey. It stays as something mm -hmm. like pure energy and it's neutral now. It's not negative, it's not positive. It's like, uh, it's like a little bit mm -hmm. of a very slight electric shock. You know, if you have, it's just a vibration. It's nothing that is super pleasant or it's something that is unpleasant. It is there for a while and because I, took away the clothes or the the journey aspect or the train yeah. aspect of it, it doesn't stay long. It stays for a very short time. This is the nature of it. So what you're saying is in that moment, right? Like the situation happened, I messed up. Um, I go back, I sit and I see how my thoughts go from just ruminating about that particular situation and you know and then take me down the past 200 situ similar situations where i fucked up um i literally like observe myself in that situation and i and i see how my brain sort of like wants to take me down that journey but i yes. just sort of 
staying in that um stop myself from going going yes, into I stay that. in the observation this is what I do in the observation of rather than just in the feeling of feeling like an idiot or feeling embarrassed yes. upset rather than in the position that is basically you know hitchhiking and waiting for the next one to stop and take me somewhere this is the mm -hmm. normal state of mind that we have we want to pick yeah. up picked up by the next car just to go somewhere be it a bad memory good memory the next thing to do the next distraction and then we talk to the driver and hear their stories mm -hmm. and so this is the whole mess that we usually do um yeah. so again this mysterious kind of meditative place is uh i uh, you know pull back my thumb with which i was mm -hmm. indicating the hitchhike and i just see the cars you know passing by and what happens then so like you know how do you what would be the benefit there right so to me um the minute i start observing yes i observe how how that particular you know how i go into that thought process absolutely yeah. i start to understand that i also start to understand see how i like what happens after that? Like, so to me, it's like, okay, yes, I, I start to realize that like, you know, my thoughts uh, take me into that big long journey, uh, which I don't want to become. And yes, I become a little bit more centered and grounded um, in, in that moment. Is that what she means when she says like, you know, the whole egolessness or is that more the non-reaction thing that you're talking about, right? Like that is, to me, that is the principle of non-reaction, but like, the way yeah what do you mean like you know what happens at that time right like, yes well it's if anything again the the egolessness it's it's for me it's mm -hmm. too high of a concept that is basically spiritual liberation so i would i wouldn't put it here if anything if anything then okay it gives you a very small glimpse of that peace maybe. yeah so, yeah but this is the furthest that i would go i would not call it egolessness that's for me is a trivialization of of those kind of extreme buddhist principles. Really? what Do what i would say happens is mm -hmm. uh now i can take an ideal case and then the normal case ideal case is at that moment when the facade falls off when the the the, the shell falls off the cardboard mm -hmm. expose themselves as such and there's just this energy that stays within me for a few seconds at that moment it's done it's finished it doesn't it doesn't pain me anymore this event right this embarrassment whatever it is it's got i can think about it if i want to i can go back but it's just like okay what did i have for breakfast like that happened that happened that that, that happened it becomes a very neutral uh possible uh, object of my memory this is what ideally okay now what mm -hmm. typically would happen is that i'm not a hundred percent in this observation mode because the skill to do that mm -hmm. to, to be super frank about it, the skill to be a hundred percent in that observation mode is the skill of spiritual liberation so i will not be a hundred percent in this observation mode i'm be in this observation mode as far as i have developed that skill and let's say i'm a good meditator and i'm kind of doing it to a 50 percent to give it yeah. um, a number for the sake mm -hmm. of simplicity it means that not everything will be dissolved i will not have to solve everything and part mm -hmm. of the pain from that situation will still be there which means it will come up again and again but it's probably even already below the threshold of being an issue it, it, it goes to the storage room of shitty situations that I don't want to be repeated and I hate my work and uh, hopefully I soon get into holidays. But it's not that it follows me throughout the day, disturbs my sleep, makes me embarrassed to go to work anymore. It's just one more thing. Yeah, it's just one of these things. So I have, I have dissolved it so much that it's not standing out as something that uh, as an individual event, as a distinct event, pains me. This is more probably what will happen for most people when they take such a meditative stand about it. And this, they will 
this kind of relief will stand out for them as something unusual. They will like it. So it's not just like, oh, it's past, so I don't have to think about it anymore. It will come up with a realization like, oh my God, this is amazing. And they will talk about it and they will want to write a book about it and <laughs> all these things because they experienced something that, um, that resulted immediately in, 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 in the disappearance of an issue that they had before. So they will start to build a thing either for them, them alone or to their partners and friends or to other people as well. So this is the more realistic case. So, okay, okay. So what you're saying is like sort of, you know, when you get to that place where, um, you know, you sit down, you start to observe and you just say, oh, okay, I'm gonna just like see that as a scene and stop myself and not, um, and not go on that journey. Do you, in that scenario, then also stop learning from that situation? Because the reason why that thought sort of, you know, the embarrassment and the sadness sort of comes is because I am like, I made a mistake, right? Like, mm -hmm. so going back to that example, I made a mistake at work or wherever. Uh, I will stick to that example. I made a mistake at work. I embarrassed myself. Uh, or I showed too much anger in a meeting. Mm -hmm. If I just say, oh, okay, this is what, you know, if I sit down and I say, okay, this is what I do and I'm not going to go on the previous journey, but then I also stop learning, right? I didn't learn from that situation itself, right? Like, yeah. so then, so then you just stop going and you just mm -hmm. become the spiritual person who... <laughs> <laughs> like just yes. that, yeah <laughs> who no, is suddenly then, happy you know, with life and so on you who's know, just who, who wants who's that? just satisfied with like you yes. know all like I agree. to me the reason why you end up pushing yourself and all of that is because you want to get better at work and you want to stop yes um you want to improve right like yes. you don't want to make that mistake if I just observe myself, then I'm not going to, I'm going to repeat that mistake again. Right. Again, like the case, uh, I think you actually, you, you are, you are, you're not wrong. I think there's the, 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 it's the right conclusion from that. You learn something, but you learn something else. You learn something uh, fundamental or spiritual or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So there will be insights. Maybe there will be also insights into, uh, into what, mistakes you made specifically certainly if you want to get then into learning mode and observation mode with a coach or with yourself mm -hmm. because you're not so fixated on blaming yourself and battling with your emotions actually you're at a better place to reflect on it because i mean this is what coaches do right mm -hmm. they look at it from the outside they see things that you don't see and so on so because I divorced myself from the um, involuntary the emotional beating. pain, right? Yeah. If I'm so inclined, I think I can look at it in a in a more uh, satisfactory, more effective way. If I wanted to learn from it, but the automatic realization mm -hmm. will be something more. Ah, I was too wrapped up in my emotions. Why do I stress myself so much? So yes, the automatic. Uh, kind of learning outcome will be more a spiritual one. Then again, I would say, when you said, yes, we want to grow, we want to be successful, mm -hmm. what for? So we want these things without really knowing what the end game is. The end game is usually, as I tried to describe a couple of times in, in one of the episodes uh, of the, I think it was called something like the complex complex look at the human mind or something like that it's an image it's a fantasy because society we get the impression from society that uh not only by the way it's also in our mind that likes power but uh we we follow something that we think oh if i got the ceo become the ceo of this company then things would be great and if i think about it of course they wouldn't ceos are usually miserable people so but also powerful yeah, which is satisfactory. Yeah. It, yeah. it certainly it's fascinating for the mind. Does it make me mm -hmm. happy? No. So to a certain degree, yes, we 
we will not be driven to squeeze the situation kind of to the full extent to become perfect present presentation artists and so on because this is another kind of mm -hmm. neurotic drive that makes us do that if it's not my complete passion if i'm not really an artist who wants to perfect their game you know of meet kind of organizing meetings mediating presenting and so on um so all in all i to me at least uh i think that the outcome is good because i'm in a good place to reflect if i want to and i got a little bit happier as a person okay i'm going to go back to that emotion again yes um but and and the reason i like i i hear what you're saying right like in that moment i start to learn and when only when i've stopped beating myself up do i really um do i really just like learn to grow and get better at that situation itself and also obviously get happy or peaceful right um but going back to like that particular emotion uh you, in you you mess up going going back to the example you go to work you have a meeting you mess up yeah that pain that emotional pain even if i stop my my thoughts from going on that train of mm -hmm. all the other times i messed up that pain of that mess up right is is how do you the way that she talks about it and that's how i understood it is you know you need to um you need to you need to let that pain or that emotion of just that one situation the energy of that emotion pierce your heart um you just sort of stay with that and she sort of gave that example of um you know a group of monks are walking down and they're going to this mona monastery or abbey um mm -hmm. and basically there's a dog on the road and he's like growling and the minute uh like the minute they start to cross him he his chain comes on them the dog's chain comes on them and they he comes to attack uh, these monks and only one of them actually uh, all of them start to run away and the dog's following and only one of them actually runs towards the dog uh the senior most one goes and runs towards the dog and the dog gets so shocked that he just stops and like stops growling and just like stops in his track and she's like that is what you're supposed supposed to do with that emotion of that that extreme you know the sadness and the upsetness and the and you know the embarrassment um and disappointment right like i think like to me when she said the egolessness um sort of happens as you you stay in that sadness and that emotion that upsetness what so is the egolessness on that because so in a way you, in the common way when i stay in my sadness it's full blown ego so what would be egolessness it is so that i think to me that is where my question is like what do you think it, just continuing on that example or you can even go into a, a, another example of like you know when you're going through a depression because things are not like life is um not going your way or like you know you have a lot yes. of sadness around you know your somebody died in your family or your career didn't go your way there is a lot of like sadness and disappointment what she's saying is don't run away from it stay in that don't try to fix it fix it but stay with that and that is when you get to that eventual you know the egolessness uh do you not agree so like going to that particular example do you not agree that that's what you're supposed that's to that's correct i do not do? agree with the with the wording of it i think it's too vague i wouldn't know how to understand that i will try I, I'll try to put it into more precise terms, if I may. I don't mm -hmm. know if that works. Um, so, egolessness implies an ego. Ego itself is very vague, and people have different definitions of that. So, which is why I can make up my own definition right now. And I would put it right now as the agency in us that produces the emotional states, the exaggerated emotional states. not the one that is perceiving that 
but the producer of that. So yeah. for me, then egolessness is the state where I stop doing that. I stop producing it. Now, okay, brackets mm -hmm. again. How do you this... stop even producing that? Like to me, in that moment, it has, she's, what she's saying is, when you stay with that, do you stop producing it, right? Like, yeah, but that's not necessarily true because again, I mean, if I want to, I, I, in a certain way, I stay with sadness when I'm fully let myself go in sadness. That's, I'm in sadness with that, mm -hmm. I'm with sadness. And that doesn't stop anything. I'm indulging that. I can stay with anger in a very non-spiritual way, which is another word of saying, I can escalate my my anger just thinking about this asshole and what they did to me and so on. I'm there. I'm with that. Why doesn't that work? So the, there must be another element that she refers to, mm -hmm. uh, but has to be put more precisely so that it's a little bit clearer, at least conceptually, what the difference is. Because I don't think that the mind is running away from that. It's uh, it's it's it perpetually it constantly throws us into uh, impulses and memories and desires that are heavily emotionally loaded. So, um, I it like I think I sort of like you know I think the way you and I have discussed in the past when things like this happen, you're like, okay, you know, when you stay with that emotion, eventually the, you start to realize. What does it mean to stay with an emotion? For example, you know, you say, okay, I, I'm disappointed uh, in my career or I'm disappointed that I messed up in this particular situation. And you start to realize how most of us, like the way I interpret it is, you start to realize that a lot of us make the same mistake and you start to become more empathetic towards others okay. and you start to become not, you know, you forgive yourself and you sort of like, you know, when others make that same mistake around you, uh -huh. you start to forgive them more. And to me, that is what I interpreted it as the egolessness or the thing that, you know, what she's mentioning it as egolessness. Can, can we put it in a different term? Because both egolessness and staying with that is too vague for me. You're doing something very specific when you do what you just described, which is you look at it from different angles. You look at it from the angle, for example, of another person, right? So I was in the mm -hmm. meeting, I messed up. How was the person next to me perceiving that? Was it for them the full-blown catastrophe as it was for me? How was the boss that was criticizing me? What was it for them? Mm -hmm. Was it something that are they contemplating now to fire me or was it just a feedback that was done in a, you know, not the nicest way, but they do it all the time. And again, it would be not catastrophic for them. So I, one element for certain that you said is I look at it from different perspectives. I look at, I, I switch positions basically. Mm -hmm. So, which is not the same for me and not immediately the same as staying with that which is uh, i don't know what that would you know it's not automatically understandable for me what that would mean and to change positions it's much more a technical thing that i can understand so you should so what you're saying is you should just like my my question here is actually what do you do right like you feel very sad you feel disappointed because you had an expectation going into the meeting that you know what, this is a meeting that's going to show me as like the big guy, I'm gonna get my promotion out of it. And almost the opposite happened. I I said something incorrectly, it spiraled into a bad conversation. Now I don't even know if I'll have a job, let alone like forget about getting that yes. um, uh, promotion. I'm so, I was embarrassed in front of all my colleagues and peers. Um, yeah. And it, what do you do in that situation? Right? Yeah, what do you do, right? Okay, I'm stopping myself from that thought process. What do I do in that situation? Okay. Uh, before we mm -hmm. run into what we do is try to get another perspective of where I am at that moment. And basically, I'm, I mean, stuck, was, yeah. I'm stuck in a negative. No, I'm sad. You're stuck in the sadness then. Is yeah. the sadness suddenly disappearing? It's not. So 
for whatever reason, the sadness, the catastrophic mm -hmm. thinking, the desperation, the embarrassment stays there and it comes back again and again and again in a very boring, repetitive way. Boring. Which is why we run away from so, it and get drunk. Yep. Okay. But so we're stuck in a very specific negative interpretation of that, right? Emotionally and cognitively. It's like a scene mm -hmm. that is repeating again and again. Yeah. So when I see it this way, what I need to do is to get away from the stuckness, which explains why we try to, try to run away from it and why we booze mm -hmm. and so on. There is the right intuition of, okay, I need to get away from that, right? Yeah. Uh, so now the question then remains, what is the correct way to get away from that, right? Mm -hmm. Now there are the mundane ways, and I'm not yeah. even saying that they don't always work. Sometimes, I'm not saying it's a good thing. Yeah. Distraction sometimes works to a certain extent. Yeah. To a certain and you sleep it out and some in the morning it right. feels less catastrophic right. yeah so sometimes it works and therefore it's not completely wrong to tell myself you know what just sleep it off have a drink with friends and then tomorrow yeah. will be better the the problem is only if i try to repeat that even though it doesn't work right so i had two beers and it's still there so then i just want to add another two beers mm -hmm. it doesn't go away this evening the day after i i still think about it and then yeah. i just do it more and the same right mm -hmm. you know, have even heavier boozing even heavier um yeah. distraction so this is kind of my my argument against these kinds of things i have to be critical to see is the thing that i'm trying is the way that i'm trying to run away from it does it work or not run away, get away, free myself from that law oh. where I am. So if that doesn't work, or an alternative thing is the psychological flexibility that I try to uh, employ, which means, for example, to take different perspectives again. What does that mean? Have I ever been uh, the event? What does it mean for me? Have I ever been that embarrassed? What did I do in the past? What could I do in the future? Um, how do I make sure if I really get fired or not? Can I have an HR meeting uh, next week so that I can have peace of mind or clarity? Uh, how did other people perceive it? Can I get a coach? Like all those psychological things that mm -hmm. I can do, which can, when they work, give me relief or free me to a certain extent from this fixed, rigid interpretation of how bad it this event was, right? And then there is the spiritual thing where, again, I'm not interested in those circumstances. I'm not interested in what could be done better and you know all those mundane yeah. ways of life uh, solutions that would come to mind. Um, but I'm interested in freeing myself in a much more fundamental way. So this happening this event where I'm kind of fixed in my negative and mm -hmm. my sadness and my disappointment and so on, in my negative ways, becomes for me an example of a way that I'm trapped that I don't want to be trapped in. I don't want to just treat that. For me, it becomes the bigger things like, you know what? I never want to be in the position where work has the capability to affect me to such a negative way in such a negative way that it robs me of sleep and so on. So so the way I the think of now, I, just sorry, I want to just yeah. that so the tool that I'm looking for now is not just to solve that issue. I have to look at it in a broader way. And one possibility of that is I get into this observation mode. A metaphor for that is now I'm not a participant of the scene. Now I'm not wiggling around with uh, what is happening in my mind. It's something like I am. I, will, I got the task to hunt down mm -hmm. an animal. So I'm a hunter now in this image. But mm -hmm. I have not studied this animal yet. It's like a new kind and someone rich offered me whatever, or a zoo wants me to catch it. So I have to study this thing now. I have to know how it lives, when it's active, what it's eating, how can I trap it. So, and I give this metaphor to show how far removed I do this observation. I'm not hating this animal. I'm not enamored with that. I'm studying it really like a scientist. So I, this is how when I do this, if I'm interested in when I do this more spiritual approach, this is how far I zoom back from my personal involvement of that and 
how sad and how whatever bitter or despaired I am. I'm interested in this phenomenon. What is this damn thing that is stuck in my mind? When does it come mm -hmm. up? When does it go? How does it stay? What is feeding that? Right? So I, come, I become interested in that very specific zoomed out way. And obviously when I, um, there will be synergy effects. If I'm successful and I learn something about that, I will not only have learned about that emotion. It will be immediately mm -hmm. occurring to me, apparent to me, uh, how that transfers into other situations and how with other difficult emotional states of mind, I can use a similar approach or I will learn something from what I learned about this particular animal. So, so basically what you're saying is, right? Like when that emotion happens, I say, okay, I don't want to feel that emotion again and be in that situation again. Now, let me figure out where did that embarrassment or upsetness, what does that embarrassment and upset looks like what does it feel like yes. when does that happen let me not even get into the situation uh, where that happens um and figure out ways to do that right is that what you're saying yes basically yes uh i just want to uh, i think it could be a little bit misleading of what i said right now that's that's it's a very kind of distant uh remote yeah. observation i can do this distant remote observation also when I'm fully wrapped up in the feeling, which might be closer to what um, Pema Chodron was talking mm -hmm. about. So I can go in there because I might have the idea that I need to observe this animal from a very, very, very close proximity. So I, so I basically, in that moment at work, um, while I have messed up and now I'm just sitting and waiting for the meeting to get over, I sort of like look at it and say, what is happening now I'm still completely detached i'm no still matter completely. i'm i'm letting it swoop over me or i'm letting it wrap me up mm -hmm. but i am still in the position from that i'm observing from i'm still completely detached no matter the distance that i'm looking at it because otherwise if i'm not detached it will take me away and it will be a very mundane normal uh, experience so this is the distinctive factor for me I see. Now, for me, the like the way I wanted to sort of was hoping I'll get an answer is to me, the, this particular situation like has happened three times or five times in the past and will happen another five times as I grow in my career, right? right. Um, it'll continue happening, maybe at a different scale and a different level uh, and all of that. Right. Um, the mess ups will happen. I will say the wrong thing or someone will hear it the wrong way. Um, like to me, isn't, isn't the work just to say, okay, how do I, um, how do I learn to just deal with that better? Or is, or the way that you are describing this of like, you know, looking at it, like, it seems like then you just like stop trying to grow in your career, right? Like, um, Yes, and I don't see that conclusion. Now, if the only thing that kept me in the career was my ambivalent uh, relationship to money and power, and then by treating it spiritually, this ambition goes away, then yes, the career would stop. If there's a genuine mm -hmm. interest that is deeply rooted within me that I'm really fascinated by, you know, building up structures, building teams, mm -hmm. moving a project forward, or I'm very interested in very particular thing how engineering and technology can improve yeah. uh, you know humanity or something like that uh -huh. why would i lose that no it's it's deeply rooted it gives me joy of course i would continue I so see. i would not have that okay. I would not have that concern it will not rob me of everything it takes off kind of the superficial layers of my interests in certain things or fascination with things okay so in that moment um i so what you're saying is like you know I understand. So it, you know, it may happen that some people will just be like, okay, I don't even want to be in these situations like over and over again. Yeah. But for others, uh, it may be more like, okay, how? let me look at the disappointment and the upsetness 
and how does it feel like what what does it look like but what um I'm what happens to wrap, then? I have to wrap it up slowly. Yeah. So maybe you can. Yeah, absolutely. Your next question but, is a cliffhanger. Yeah. And to me, the question is like, what what happens then, right? Like what happens in those in that moment when I'm observing that just that shame or that upsetness and the disappointment that now has happened because I couldn't get any like, you know, my message across. I I yeah. said the wrong thing what happens when I just like keep looking and observing it to me I think like if you answer that then we can wrap up <laughs> well ideally it goes back to um to what I said and what is in the book frankly ideally what happens you become free of the rigid emotional place which was forced on you imposed on you by the pain that you experienced you become free of that you don't become free of having said something wrong or having you know crashed the project, that of course is still a fact, but mm -hmm. your ability to look at it from different perspectives and to draw conclusions, to learn from that, you are much more free to do that now. So it's, it's mostly about that I am, that the pain forces me to look at it at exactly the same repetitive traumatic way again and again. I'm a failure, I'm shit, I'm not worthy of being employed. I'm a fraud, blah, 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 blah. All those things that go through people's mm -hmm. mind. I'm free of that. Which would be a relief, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. And um, we will talk again with another chapter inspired by the book, When Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron. <laughs>